Welcome to this webinar looking at the question, is it time to start blowing up the pipelines, part of the Friends of the Earth Learning Hub for 2022. This is an ongoing series to help engage our members to hear from expert speakers, to collaborate with other educators and look at various global justice themes and deepen our understanding and our responses to them. This year, the series has already explored activism through the arts, energy poverty and retrofitting, navigating climate anxiety and other topics as well through reading materials, films and inspiration from speakers like tonight's speakers on this panel who are going to discuss various tactics utilized by activists past and present. This webinar is inspired by the themes from the book How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andrea Small. Our discussion tonight is chaired by Oshin Coughlin, who many of you know as Director of Friends of the Earth Ireland. Oshin has also worked previously with the Latin American Solidarity Centre, Fair Trade Labelling Organisation International and Christian Aid. Oshin also co-founded the Stop Climate Chaos Coalition as well as the Environmental Pillar and led an eight-year campaign for climate change law in Ireland. So I'll now I'll pass over to Oshin to tell you more about tonight's discussion and the panelists. Thanks, Evelyn, and thanks for all your work at setting this up and this and helping us with this discussion. Um, so this discussion came about uh, for two reasons. One is that I was given this book that, that you've seen on our website over the last few months, How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andreas Mann, and it's fantastic to have him with us. And as I began to look at it before I even read it, it, remi it reminded me of something. And it reminded me of this, which I have, which I got as a teenage boy, if you can see it. Did your granny have a hammer? Uh, which I think was from the mid 80s. And it was about the history of the Irish suffrage movement. And I was struck by, although struck by this, not quite the similarities, but uh, the, uh, in the title, but the, the resonances from the title. Uh, and equally, as I began to read Andreas' book, and he, and he compared progressive struggles from the past with how the climate movement has acted, I was struck by something in what he had said compared to what I'd written. So I wrote in a piece for our supporters over 10 years ago, I think before Copenhagen, probably before, before the uh, COP15 in Copenhagen, I, I wrote that, uh, that this climate struggle, the struggle for climate justice was our generation's anti-slavery movement, our generation's civil rights movement, our generation's suffragette movement, and our suffragist movement and our generation's anti-apartheid movement. I think was all these things rolled into one so existential and so uh, important was it and so intersectional was it. But when I wrote that, I was thinking primarily, if not exclusively, of mass mobilization, of the public to put pressure on decision makers, and maybe on civil disobedience, on the kind of climate camps that we've had in Ireland, the kind of, uh, um, you know, blockades perhaps. But I, I, I realized in reading Andrews's book that I was omitting from my own memory of history or, from, or my own knowledge of history, let's say the diversity and plurality of tactics that those progressive movements had, had used in making their case and winning their argument uh, uh, over, over time. And it, it got me thinking, well, you know, maybe, you know, we're not, because it's not as if in those 15 years or so since I wrote those words, that we have got as far as we would like, which is part of what Andres' book is about in, in the climate struggle. So I felt, God, this is time. It's time to have this discussion in the, you know, I'm reading this book, it's great. It's time to have this discussion in the open with people who can shed light on it, like Andreas and Louise, and people who are working on it in Ireland, who have at least pushed the boundaries a bit of what uh, the tactics we have used. Because Friends of the Earth, as you all know, is a pretty mainstream NGO that does lots of petitions, lots of emails, lots of is involved in lots of protests. But we haven't even gone down the road towards, you know, civil disobedience or nonviolent direct action, albeit that we were supportive of the climate camps that took place uh, in Ireland ten years ago. It isn't in our own uh, toolbox, shall we say. So I thought it was time to have that conversation uh, more more openly. And so that's 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 the parameters here. That's that, that's the inspiration. The parameters are questions like, well, what we have, we, I think, and we'll hear from William and Zach. We don't even have very much non-violent direct action in Ireland around climate, uh, to be honest. Um, we have we have we have a we have a diversity of demands. We have more radical demands versus more you know more cautious demands. But we have very little diversity of actual tactics and strategies to achieve those demands. Um, whereas in Ireland, over many, many years, we have seen a diversity of tactics on, on a number of issues, not, uh, from the national question to suffragism, as we'll hear more in, lately, uh, shortly. Um, so the, and then on a global scene, as Andreas points out, we have not seen very much. Uh, we've seen some direct action, non-violent direct action. We've seen almost no property destruction. Uh, never mind, and Andreas is very clear, and I'll say this once now, he might say it more, 
the spectrum of discussion or the spectrum of his book is not about violence against people, it is about violence against property, along with all those other tactics we've mentioned. So why hasn't that happened? Would it be justified and how it, would it be effective and how would it work and what would it look like? They're the kinds of questions we're going to look at both internationally and nationally and both philosophically and practically and both historically and, contem and contemporaneously. And with that, I'm going to start off by handing over to Andreas, who's going to read us uh, a, 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 a small uh, uh, section of his book, which is really quite, it's quite short, but it packs a huge punch and has a, re a great range of historical and uh, um, an academic and expert uh, and experiential um, uh, thought in it. So I'm going to hand over to you, Andreas. Uh, I should introduce you more first, other than being the author of this book. And Andreas will, will read a little bit and then we'll ask him some questions. And the format then is we'll then go to Louise, to, to, who's, a, who's a, an expert in the, in the history of the Irish suffrage movement and a wider ac academic to bring that perspective. And then William and Zach have both been involved now and over some time in, 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 in activism and direct action in Ireland. So that's, and then we'll go to Q and A. That's 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 the format. But just to say a little bit more about um, about Andres before before I ask him to read, as he gathers his as he choose, finds his page in his book. So Andres is an associate professor of human ecology from Lund University in Sweden. He's the author of The Progress of the Storm and Fossil Capital, uh, uh, which won the Isaac and Tamara Dutcher Memorial Prize, and of course the author of this book, which has inspired this discussion. He's been called one of the most productive and provocative historical thinkers on the left right now by Adam Tulsa and one of the most original thinkers on the subject by Naomi Klein. So, Andreas, read us a bit of your book. Thank you so much, Oshin. Did I pronounce that reasonably OK? OK, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have omitted a key fact from the first pages of this book, uh, where I describe how I um, happened to end up in, uh, at the very first COP summit in Berlin in 1995. And that fact uh, is that it was the Swedish branch of the Friends of the Earth that took me there, or, or it was together with, with other comrades from the, the Swedish uh, section of the Friends of the Earth that I went to COP1 in 1995 in Berlin. Um, I lived in a small town in uh, Western Sweden where the local branch of the Friends of the Earth was extremely important to for for political education um, and and you know teaching young people like myself about the environmental and social issues of the day. So I owe a big um, debt to your organization. Um, uh, although I don't mention it by name in relating the story of going to COP one, uh, I'll I'll just read a couple of pages that follow from the description of some of the scenes at COP1. Uh, since COP1 in 1995, the US has set off a boom in fossil fuel extraction, once again becoming the world's top producer of oil and gas. Home to the largest network of pipelines, it has added upwards of 800,000 miles, multiplying and elongating, elongating the high pressure hoses for dousing fuel on the fire. Germany, where COP1 happened, uh, has continued to dig up nearly 200 million tons of brown coal, the dirtiest of all fossil fuels, every year. The open pit mines expand relentlessly, forests and villages being torn down, so the, boot, the sooty bowls can stretch beyond the horizon and the excavators can shovel up more soft, soft rock to be set on fire. Since COP1, my home country, Sweden, has initiated one of the largest infrastructure projects in its history, a massive ring road highway. Nothing extraordinary, just another highway. Coiling around Stockholm, it is meant to carry more cars, spewing out ever more millions of tons of the noxious element. In April 1995, the month COP1 came to an end, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 stood at 363 parts per million. In April 2018, it was higher than 410 ppm. And it has, of course, continued to rise since then. Uh, so I wrote these words in uh, uh, late 2018, and uh, what follows is, a cloud of smoke billows across Siberia as I write these words. It originates from wildfires of unprecedented extent and ferocity within the Arctic Circle. For weeks, the flames have been sweeping through what should be the coldest forests on Earth and sending up plumes into one giant formation of soup. Sorry, this was in late 2019, not 18. The cloud is now larger than the territory of the European Union. Before it dissipates, swathes of the Amazon catch fire and turn to ash at a pace never registered before. To say that the signals have fallen on the deaf ears of the ruling classes of this world would be an understatement. If these classes ever had any senses, they have lost them all. They are not perturbed by the smell from the blazing trees. 
They do not worry at the sight of islands sinking. They do not run from the roar of the approaching hurricanes. Their fingers never need to touch the stalks from withered harvests. Their mouths do not become sticky and dry after a day with nothing to drink. To appeal to their reason and common sense would evidently be futile. The commitment to the endless accumulation of capital wins out every time. After the past three decades, there can be no doubt that the ruling classes are constitutionally incapable of responding to the catastrophe in any other way than by expediting it. Of their own accord, under their inner compulsion, they can do nothing but burn their way to the end. And so we are still here. We erect our camps of sustainable solutions. We cook our vegan food and hold our assemblies. We march, we block, we stage theaters. We hand over lists of demands to ministers. We chain ourselves, we march the next day too. We are still perfectly, immaculately peaceful. There are more of us now by orders of magnitude. There is another pitch of desperation in our voices. We talk of extinction and no future. And still, business continues very much as usual. At what point do we escalate? When do we conclude that the time has come to also try something different? When do we start physically attacking the things that consume our planet and destroy them with our own hands? Is there a good reason we have waited this long? And I'll stop there. And obviously, uh, this, um, this argument was formulated uh, a couple of years ago, and things have happened since then. But the basic trends, I would say, are still in place, including very much business as usual reigning supreme. Um, although the climate movement is beginning, as I see it, to discuss various types of escalation and, and perhaps diversification into sabotage, but we can talk more about that later. This, this was just to set the stage or the, the scene for the, for the general argument in the book uh, where I sort of raised the question when, when or if should we uh, start physically attacking things as well. Yes. Thanks, Andreas. And, and your extract does indeed set the, um, uh, the scene from, my, from the first question I have, which I've, I'm basically, all I'm doing is, is to, to be transparent to those who have or haven't read the book. It's, I, I, it's, Different parts of the book, and I'm asking basically questions that that prompt Andreas to to bring us through parts of his analysis from from the book. Um, but you call the climate movement's strict adherence to only non-violent forms of activism and, and even direct action as strategic pacifism, and invoking Nelson Mandela, you describe it as turning a tactic into a fetish. One of your central arguments in the first part of the book is that this commitment to only non-violent means is based on a misreading of history. So can you talk us through your analysis of past progressive struggles, such as anti-slavery, the civil rights and anti-apartheid movements, which I mentioned in my introduction? Uh, maybe we'll leave suffragettes to Louise, yeah, yeah. but talk through those and what your reading of those and your analysis of those is compared to the way the climate movement has tended to see them. Yeah, so strategic pacifism is distinct from moral pacifism, the moral version saying that it's morally wrong to engage in any kind of violence, be it against property or against people, and therefore we should not do it. Strategic pacifism is the idea that we can draw lessons from past struggles that clearly indicate that it's strategically unwise to engage in any kind of violence. This then being based on the conclusion from a study of past struggles that what works, what is effective, what brings about the intended change is strict adherence to nonviolence, And this is an idea propounded by quite a few uh, parts of the climate movement and intellectuals. It was very, very central to Extinction Rebellion when it was launched. Uh, it's largely derived from um, a particular school of academic um, studies of uh, social struggles. Uh, primarily associated with uh, Maria Stevens and Erika Chenoweth, who wrote a book called um, Why Civil Resistance Works. And this school claims precisely that past experiences of anti-colonial struggles and uh, democratic movements show very clearly that the only thing that works is nonviolence, nonviolent civil resistance, and any kind of diversification into more militant tactics leads to defeat. This position is far from uncontroversial in, 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 the, in the research community. So there, there are researchers working on this that hotly dispute these conclusions from Chenoweth and Stevens. And more broadly, strategic pacifists, they tend to um, 
adduce various examples to back up their case, such as the struggle against slavery, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, <clears throat> um, various struggles for democracy, um, the civil rights movement, um, in recent struggles for democracy would include Ar the Arab Spring revolutions, for instance, and of course the, the suffragette movement, but we'll leave that for later. Um, my reading of all of these cases is that strategic pacifism uh, rests on what uh, some comrades have called peace washing. So it's rest on, on leaving out or washing away elements of these struggles that did not at all conform to absolute peaceful uh, modes of protest. I mean, slavery is perhaps the most obvious example. Uh, slavery was first abolished during the Haitian Revolution, which was a very violent affair. And uh, the, the abolition of slavery didn't happen because white people engaged in peaceful protest, it was fundamentally rooted in the resistance of the slaves or the enslaved people themselves. And this resistance was very often quite violent and included forms of, of property destruction uh, and of course, military conflict, notably in the US where slavery only came to an end after a very bloody civil war. This is not to suggest that we should have a civil war against the fossil fuel industry or something like that, or that we, that we should, uh, copy Nat Turner and, and, this, and slaughter whatever our enemy would be. But it's to say that the idea that the struggle against slavery teaches us that what works is exclusively peaceful, nonviolent modes of protest is, is, is not in line with what actually happened in history. And this is very easy to show. Anti-colonial revolutions, likewise, uh, I spent some time on, on Gandhi and, you know, the, the myth that Gandhi uh, consistently opposed violence when, in fact, he supported uh, and tried to engage in some forms of violence, notably uh, trying to recruit people to struggle for the British Empire in the, in the First World War. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, and and uh, the anti-colonial revolutions in India and virtually every other place that I know of, including Ireland, included uh, moments of uh, uh, militant conflict that went far beyond the, the prescriptions of uh, nonviolent uh, civil resistance. Um, and you can, I mean, you find the same in the civil rights movement in the in the U.S. that gave gave rise to the idea of the radical flank effect, where you had a, a massive components of property destruction and, and things like that. And likewise with the with the uh, Arab Spring revolutions or other kinds of dem democratic revolutions. I mean, the, just the storming of the Berlin Wall it was it one big act of property destruction, which uh, would, would fall outside the boundaries of uh, nonviolence as defined by. Stevens and Chenoweth and, and others. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you, could, you can follow this all the way up to, for instance, the uh, uprising after the murder of George Floyd, which included si very significant components of property destruction, starting notably with the conquest of the police station in the third precinct in Minneapolis, where Derek Chauvin and his colleagues had been based, and the burning down of that police station after the police had been chased away from it. And uh, uh, this sort of property destruction was a persistent element of that uprising, even though, of course, the bulk of the activities and the, the, the vast majority of the people that engaged in that uprising did so uh, uh, through peaceful means. But there was an element of more militant confrontation that seemed to have served quite uh, uh, important uh, purposes in that uh, in that episode, very significant episode of recent social struggle in the U.S. And we could go on. I mean, the, the, my reading of history, uh, as opposed to that advocated by the strategic pacifists, is that uh, virtually all cases of successful social mobilization have included a diversity of tactics. This is not to denigrate the importance of strictly peaceful mass action, which tends to be the major component of uh, social struggles, because that's how you uh, most easily engage large numbers of people. But uh, it, it's simply a falsification of the historical record to ignore the elements of militant contestation 
that have uh, very often been integrated into these mass protests, very notably in, in the Egyptian revolution, for instance, uh, in, in, in 2011. Not to say that that case ended in, in triumph, obviously, but uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a, most of my research is, is historical and I'm a, I'm a bit of a history nerd, so we could, we could discuss the, the historical issues uh, deeply if you like, but this is my, my take on the issue. And uh, um, I'll, I'll, I would say that the, the sort of scientific backlash against Stevens and Chenoweth is quite strong right now, where you have a lot of papers being published uh, showing precisely the holes in their arguments and how uh, the, the diversity of tactics is, is more the rule than the, than the exception in, in uh, successful struggles. Thanks, Andreas. That's really helpful. And we'll be coming up, we'll be returning to history in a, in a minute. Later in the book, uh, with, with suffrage, later, later in the book, you look at the arguments you've encountered inside the climate movement or from, or from you know, leading lights in the climate movement against the idea of, of a radical flank, although they don't put it that way, of, but of more militant resistance, like sabotage of fossil fuel infrastructure. And those included, well, I'll let you go through them, but uh, like the issue of time, we haven't exhausted nonviolence. The issue of inclusivity and, and demography in, uh, uh, in, in the movement, democracy, and whether or not we'd lose public support by doing it. You, I, I was really struck in the, in, in the book how you went, you know, you picked those apart and, and unpacked them. And, and could you, so could you, because I'm sure even in this discussion and those in the chats, I saw somebody saying, you know, wouldn't the state hit back or wouldn't we lose support? Mm -hmm. What's your, and we'll, we may come back to those questions later, what's your first take though on, on those kind of common objections to the idea of, of, of a of a radical flank or a militant resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just uh, engage in some uh, promotion uh, <laughs> on behalf of my publisher here that uh, Verso, uh, who published this book, just put out a free downloadable ebook called Property Will Cost Us the Earth, and um, that includes uh, a lot of different texts uh, by um, climate activists around the world on various aspects of, um, of the struggle um, uh, uh, for, for climate justice and uh, texts that sort of respond to the argument in my book, um, including, for instance, a pretty critical piece by Alyssa Battistoni, who argues in, in a manner that's not at all unconvincing, I, I would say, uh, that um, large scale, uh, sabotage would um, elicit such a uh, such a destructive response from the state that it would uh, harm the movement i mean there's there's clearly that risk any kind of escalation has the risk of provoking a, a massive backlash from the existing institutions in society that's part of the game so to speak um, uh, the illusion, I think, is that the climate movement can succeed without having to uh, deal with this problem. Uh, as in, we can just avoid the forces of repression and avoid uh, imprisonment or, you know, having to try to uh, outwit the cops and uh, minimize repression and just engage in the kind of tactics that are not punishable by law and that we can still win without uh, you know uh, exposing ourselves to the risk of repression uh, and also in a sense uh, when the climate movement has started to engage in civil disobedience, like XR, for instance, there, there has, of course, been repression. The way, to, to, the, the way that much XR activism has uh, approached this problem is to almost make it a virtue to be arrested, as in this being part of the protocol of civil disobedience to get as many people in jail as possible. And I mean, I, I can see the point of this to an extent, but my approach to this problem of repression would rather be to, for activists to try to achieve as much as possible while getting away and avoiding arrests. 
And that should be our starting point when we uh, uh, deal with this problem. How can we maximize our impact while minimizing the blows against us that the state will surely try to deliver? And uh, uh, this, I mean, this boils down to, <laughs> to concrete instances and, and examples. And uh, I, let me just mention to you an, uh, an action that happened in late February in, um, in uh, uh, British Columbia that I describe uh, in some detail in, in my introduction to the property, it will cost us the earth book, uh, which was a, an, an extremely high profile action of property destruction at the coastal gas link pipeline in, uh, um, in British Columbia. This pipeline that you might have seen triggered massive blockades in, in Canada in 2020, uh, but that still went ahead. And it runs through uh, the territory of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, probably didn't pronounce that correctly, but anyway. And on the night, on the night of, uh, I think it was the 20th of February, all of a sudden 20 activists who were masked emerged from uh, the dark woods at the entrance to a construction site where this pipeline would be inserted into the ground under a river. <clears throat> and uh, the activists chased away the security guards and whatever workers were on the place and entered the site and had it uh, under their own control for a couple of hours or something like that and uh, seized various kinds of trucks and bulldozers to completely wreck the site and destroy all the equipment that they could find. And they made sure to also systematically destroy video surveillance cameras. And uh, the, the very few pictures we have from the action uh, were taken by security guards in the first moment uh, when, where you can see these masked activists approaching. And when the police came to the site, everyone was gone. And as far as I know, no arrest has still been made. So these 20 activists managed to enter the site and completely gutted and impose serious financial costs on, um, on the, the company, the big fossil fuel company in Canada building this pipeline and, and uh, creating a sort of deterrence effect because local politicians talked about this, creating a chill on investment in fossil fuel extraction in British Columbia because you now have the, the, the serious risk for investors that activists will come and actually destroy the fixed capital that you have <laughs> established on a site. And they did this not by waiting for the cops to come and arrest them, but to run away before the cops arrived and, and hide so far apparently with success. And this to me is a model action. Also because clearly the, the, the activists who, who, uh, uh, who did this were careful to only harm things and not people, uh, uh, which they could have done if they'd wanted clearly. Um, yeah. So, this is just an example of one uh, that one seems to me one thing that seems to me to be a, a successful action locally. When you deal with forces of oppression, how to avoid them and things like that, you have to think uh, about where you are in your activist community, what you can do, what you can achieve, uh, what what concrete effects something that you that you do might have or not have. So I, I don't have any general rules or principles for how to minimize repression. But I do think that we need to contend with the reality that if we push the struggle further against the interests uh, that are vested in business as usual, we will inevitably encounter the problem of repression. And our attitude to that should try to be to minimize it and not make it a virtue to end up in jail. Thanks, Andreas. And you've actually answered my next question, which is, which is about what, what might a campaign of militant resistance uh, and disruption of, of fossil fuel infrastructure and business as usual look like? Which is good because I'm conscious I want to bring our, our other panelists in, but I do have one one more question for you right now, which is, uh, you you were very clear that this is you're not proposing that we ditch all other tactics and adopt and, and adopt strategic yeah. property destruction as our only method. Yeah. But so I'm interested in your thoughts on like how would the different forms of of activism coexist in you in your in, in in given what you know from history, uh, and and your experience of the the movement of our, our, at this time. Uh, like what would the, what would or what might the the relations be between those who are engaging in in uh, in militant resistance and the more participative mainstream movement, whether that's yeah. protests or whether it's uh, advocacy and NGOs? You describe one instance around the Hanback Forest, I think, where there was 
um, uh, issues happening. Like there was there was some form of of, of uh, uh, direct intervention, but also NGO and NGO, Friends of the Earth, I think, in Germany was pursuing a legal avenue at the same time. Mm -hmm. But also, I saw I saw someone asking this question: like, is it likely that in your in the experience does having a radical flank put people off joining the movement overall, uh, as opposed to even just public support? Does it put people off joining in more generally, or actually can the two go together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are all, all very good questions. Let me just let me just quickly say that this kind of action that I described, where you have people storming a construction site and destroying it, I don't see that as the only uh, uh, model for sabotage or property destruction. I mean, you can you can have everything from that to uh, extremely gentle types of sabotage, such as uh, what the tire extinguishers you might have heard of them, are engaged in right now in, in various places in the UK and elsewhere around the world where they are deflating SUV tires that doesn't really even destroy the tires, just a momentary deflation of them. <clears throat> so it can, be, it can be anything between temporarily disabling uh, machines that uh, emit CO2 to wrecking them outright. Um, now, as for the relations between radical flanks and more mainstream currents within a movement, these uh, relations, I think, tend to be quite fraught and tense. And in a sense, the division of labor between a mainstream and a radical flank needs to be maintained because uh, the radical flank effect wouldn't work if everyone turned into the radical flank. Uh, so. When I've discussed this sometimes with people, I've, I've, I've been asked, should mainstream organizations continue to denounce the radical flank to stay mainstream? And in a sense, yes, because uh, uh, they will only seem more, seem more sort of palatable in the eyes of uh, governments or states if there is a clear uh, division between them and the radical flank. Uh, I mean, if imagine that there is a, a movement in Ireland that starts blowing up whatever pipelines you might have there. I, I, I don't know if you have a pipeline. And, and then uh, uh, Friends of the Earth jump on this bandwagon and starts to blow up pipelines as well. And then it would seem to the Irish government, presumably, that there's no difference between Friends of the Earth and this radical flank. So we'll just treat all of them as the same. And there's no one that we can negotiate with. So the, the whole theory of the radical flank effect is premised on the persistence of something like MLK in relation to Malcolm X, something like uh, uh, what would seem in the eyes of governments to be a more reasonable uh, negotiating partner that isn't as scary as the radical flank. <clears throat> uh, now, I, 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 I do think that you can find quite a few cases where radical flanks of various types inspire people to join movements. There's clearly a negative radical flank effect where you have radical flanks that go too far and, and uh, scare people off, put them off from the movement. Uh, but uh, if you look at, for instance, Just Stop Oil right now in the UK, which is uh, appearing a little bit like a radical flank, experimenting even with sabotage. They destroyed a couple of gas uh, pumps or pumps at gas stations or whatever it was the other week. And they uh, clearly represent a kind of escalation for XR in the, in the strategically offensive uh, blockades that they are undertaking against fossil fuel infrastructure. And uh, uh, there were media reports that their actions um, have uh, uh, led to a greater appetite for climate action uh, in, in the public, that more people are considering uh, engaging in climate actions. And um, uh, for all its its divisive impact. I think even Insulate Britain had an influence of that kind and managed to push uh, 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 at least the question of insulation on the agenda. And uh, although I, I have my misgivings about their particular form of blockades, because it seemed to me pretty indiscriminate, uh, <coughs> to my mind, Just Stop Oil is a much, much more uh, intelligent way of uh, striking at the real sources of the problem than just randomly cutting off or, or blocking highways. Um, yeah, but we could we could discuss this in, in much more detail. Uh, the, these relations between different parts of the movement will necessarily be dynamic and uh, not static, and they will unfold in, in different ways. Uh, and there's no guarantee that anything will ever work. It's, it's just a matter of experimentation and uh, 
I'd say in passing before we before we broaden the discussion that we have a yeah. considerable experience in Ireland of well, marginal and then increasingly mainstream organisations who don't condemn as such, but can, don't but don't uh, but don't explicitly condone or refuse to condemn. And and but let's say we have experience of movements that have managed to combine both violent and non-violent forms yeah. of action over the course of the last fifty years, never mind the last one hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, not that we're proposing to emulate that directly. Um, I want to read a, a portion of your book that I think uh, um, briefly, because I'm out to bring Louise in now, that, 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 bri that, that bridges back to, uh, that, that, that looks at both aspects of this uh, before, we, before we ask Louise to talk a little bit about, about her area of expertise. Because this starts with, this is um, a quote from Emmeline Pankhurst in your book. Uh, is not a woman's life, is not her health, are not her limbs more valuable than panes of glass? Asked Emmeline Pankhurst. Or in the words of one philosopher mulling over violent civil disobedience, if a grossly immoral war is being waged, we know one of, one of those right now, the right of railway engineers to keep the tracks in good shape may be superseded by the more important right of the people in the country to which the troops are headed to life itself. In the climate breakdown, the scales might tip quickly. On the one side, things like pipelines and diggers, on the other, on the other and FUVs, on the other, a weight that must tend towards the infinite because it encompasses all values. A woman's life, her health and limbs, the right of a people to life itself, and everything else is in peril. Because of the temporal dimension, moreover, Hanker's question must also be posed from the standpoint of future generations. And as an aside, obviously, we have some example of future generations in terms of school strikers voicing concern recently. But here's the question, as you put it, uh, uh, Andrea. Will those in school today are born next year grow up, grow, grow up to think that the machines of the fossil economy were recorded insufficient respect or will they look back on this moment in time rather like we or at least those of us with a modicum of feminist leanings look back in the suffragettes and see smashed windows as a price worth paying and indeed when suffragettes broke panes torched letterboxes and hammered on paintings these things had in and of themselves at most a tangential relation to the problem of male monopoly on the vote now the machines of the fossil economy are the problem and therefore an even more legitimate target, target, you might argue. Louise, briefly, I, I, I will, I will uh, introduce you briefly um, so that before I ask you my, my question, um, Louise is an expert in, in the history of suffrage, but particularly she's a, she studied sociology at the University of UCC and has worked at the University of Central Lancashire, London Met University, University College London, and, and has jo now joined Middlesex University. She's also appointed professorial fellow at University of Sheffield. Um, and my, 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 uh, my introductory question for you, Louise, but you're going to share some slides with us, is we've, we, have, we became very used to women being written out of the history of the Irish Revolutionary Period, and the work of yourself and many others was to, was to bring those women back into history. But what seems to have happened in the climate movement has been that we have left some of the tactics and strategies of lots of progressive movements out of our history of those. So I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about, as your, as your headline says there, about militancy and the suffrage movement in Ireland. And we can then bring that, weave that into our conversation about what happens in Ireland on the climate movement from now on. Thanks, Louise. Good to have you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So, yes, yeah, so I'm going to speak about the suffrage movement. And I think my presentation picks up on many of the points that Andreas was making, particularly around the tensions within these movements. So just a very quick um, plug for the book. Can you see these slides, by the way? Yeah? Can somebody tell yes. me if they can? Yes. yes, thank you. So I've written two recent books, um, one an edited collection with Margaret Ward, Irish Women and the Vote, and the other one, uh, which is a solo authored book, Women, Winning the Vote for Women. So just to kind of contextualize where I'm coming from with this as well. So just to say a little bit about the um, origins of the militant movement in Ireland. So in 1908, a new suffrage group was set up by two young university graduates, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington and Margaret Cousins. This was the Irish Women's Franchise League. Impatient for change and not afraid to challenge contemporary social values. In contrast to the long established suffrage movements in Ireland already, who had often adopted quite ladylike behaviour, this new Irish Women's Franchise League adopted so-called militant tactics by flouting social conventions about the acceptable behaviour of women. From addressing crowds on the backs of lorries to picketing public meetings, heckling politicians, 
and breaking some windows, the militant movement broke new ground in the Irish campaign for the vote. Now, before going any further, just to clarify a bit about terminology, because we tend to have a lot of slippage between the terms suffragette and suffragist. Now, the term suffragette was originally coined actually by a journalist as a derogatory term to refer specifically to the British Women's Social and Political Union. We've already had mention tonight of Emmeline Pankhurst and of course her two daughters, Sylvia and Christabel, are very much associated with the Women's Social and Political Union. The term suffragist, on the other hand, is a much more general term, and it's used to describe all of those who supported votes for women. And in the British context, the by far the largest suffrage group was the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, which you've probably never heard of, which is interesting, led by militant, Millicent Fawcett. So I would argue that this is a very kind of dichotomous construction of suffragist versus suffragette, it's a very British model, and I would be very wary about applying this to the Irish suffrage movement. So I think we just need to be a bit careful in how we use that kind of very British terminology in relation to the Irish case. Now, suffrage militancy in Ireland began, you could argue, on the 13th of June 1912, when eight members of the Irish Women's Franchise League were arrested for breaking windows. So it's interesting that you mentioned a moment ago that quote about smashing panes of glass. That is precisely the first militant act that the suffragists in Ireland undertook in 1912. Uh, they were, in many cases, quite seasoned campaigners who had been involved in some suffrage activities in Britain. Uh, and I list there the names of the eight Irish women who were involved. And going back to something that Andreas mentioned earlier, the women then just stood there and waited to be arrested precisely because they wanted their day in court. So this was not about avoiding the cops, as Andreas said. This was very much about being arrested and having the publicity of going to court. They were fined 40 shillings or a month's imprisonment. They all refused to pay the fine. And so they all went to jail. And that was the first jailing of Irish suffragists uh, in Ireland in 1912. However, according to historians, they were actually quite well treated in prison, for example, they were allowed to have their meals sent in from local restaurants. Now, the reaction to the outbreak of suffrage militancy in Ireland was very mixed. Even amongst the suffragists themselves, it proved to be a bone of contention. And the veteran campaigner Anna Haslam, a Cork woman like myself, was very much against the outbreak of militant tactics in Ireland. But she still went to visit Hannah Sheehy's Skeffington in prison and brought her some gifts. So militancy remained a site of disagreement throughout the rest of the suffrage campaign in Ireland, as well as in other countries where you had this division between militant and non-militant suffragists. Now, what really sort of brought these matters to a head was actually in July 1912, when Prime Minister Asquith came on an official visit to Dublin. And he was followed to Ireland by three members of the Women's Social and Political Union, and they were Lizzie ba Baker, Gladys Evans and Mary Lee. And they carried out some quite radical militant activities. They tried to set fire to the theatre where Asquith was about to give a speech. And one of them famously threw an axe at Asquith's carriage, though apparently a hit John Redmond by mistake. So Lee and Evans were arrested and they were sentenced to five years imprisonment. So that was a very substantial sentence if we compare it to the 40 shillings that the Irish suffragists had been fined for breaking glass. So we can see here a very significant escalation of suffrage, of suffrage militancy on Irish soil in the space of just one month in 1912 from breaking panes of glass to actually trying to burn down theatre. Now in protest at the length of the sentences handed out to the three English women the Irish suffragists who were still in prison at that point all went on hunger strike. Now, the hunger strike was one of the biggest weapons used by the suffragists. And the Irish women were released after one week of hunger strike because of their deteriorating health. It's important to mention that the English suffragettes who were also on hunger strike in Irish jails were forcibly fed. And they were the only suffrage prisoners to be forcibly fed. Uh, during that period. 
And as we know, forcible feeding was absolutely brutal. So going back to what Andrea said earlier, if you know, you're prepared to go down that road, the physical punishments, the physical cost to, to those who are arrested can be pretty extreme. And what we could argue that, in fact, the group who most took up the hunger strike as a weapon after imprisonment was, of course, the IRA, who virtually turned the hunger strike into, you could argue, an art form. But again, with brutal consequences. So when we talk about militancy here, we are talking you know, about really putting your life on the line. Now, while the militant Irish suffragists attempted to show solidarity for these British women who had come over to Dublin to carry out these acts of militancy, there was actually quite a lot of ill feeling because it was again seen as just another colonial act that these English women had come over to Ireland at a time, of course, when the home rule negotiations were at such a delicate state. And even Hannah Sheehy Skeffington herself said, even the best meaning English have blind spots when the Sister Isle is concerned. So we have to also be aware of how this, uh, the fact that these were English women carrying out the militant attacks actually exacerbated some of the tensions and criticisms. And even within the suffrage movement, the Monster Women's Franchise League absolutely condemned the, the English militants acts as wicked. So this is not just the first or the last time that English women came to Ireland or went to Ireland. I'm, I'm, I'm in London, so I'm slightly getting a bit uh, confused about the, the, the went and the came at the moment. So uh, there were quite a lot, actually, of activity led by the Women's Social and Political Union taking place around Belfast at this time. Attacks on Belfast Bowling and Lawn Tennis Pavilion, which I believe was actually burned to the ground, Newtonard's Race Course and the Greens of Knock Golf Club, as well as the infamous fire at Lisburn Cathedral. So we are talking about some extreme acts of militancy taking place on the island of Ireland, but mainly around Belfast, and all of those were initiated by the Women's Social and Political Union. One of the, the next steps, apparently, in the plan was in September 1913, Christabel Pankhurst wrote to Hannah Sheehy Skeffington to say that the Women's Social and Political Union were planning to set up a group in Dublin. Now, this was really resisted by Irish suffragists who were adamant they did not need the British suffragists coming over onto Irish soil and setting up in Dublin. In the end, of course, as we know, World War I was declared and all um, militants activity was abandoned by the Women's Social and Political Union for the sake of the war effort. Now, I would just like to add a few other observations around this. The first thing to say is that the division between the militants and the non-militants was largely one of tactics rather than any deep-rooted political attitudes. And it would be important to mention that the militant suffragettes were not necessarily any more politically radical than the constitutional suffragists. In fact, some commentators like Marion Duggan who was herself a constitutional suffragist, said that actually some of the British suffragettes were very far from being politically radical. And here she linked the fact that they had distanced themselves from the labor movement. And she argued that this was pressure from the wealthy and aristocratic members of the Women's Social and Political Union who did not want to be associated with labor politics. And indeed the issue of class bias uh, was a really serious division amongst all the suffragists. So according to Duggan, the militants were underestimating the achievements of the constitutional methods. And this goes back to a point that Oshin raised a few moments ago in that what was the impact, what was the success of militancy and how did that kind of uh, balance against the efforts of over 50 years of constitutional suffrage campaigns? Constitutional suffrage groups had been set up in Ireland from the 1870s. Some people would argue, in fact, that militancy actually hardened resistance to suffrage and militancy was blamed uh, for the defeats of some of the suffrage bills that had gone through Parliament. Marion Duggan went on to argue that, in fact, it was the quiet educational methods of the constitutional suffragists which were actually exposing the deep-rooted inequalities in Irish society rather than smashing a few panes of glass so here you're getting a very opposite view from the constitutional suffragists. Now, it is very hard to say one way or the other whether the militant tactics were more successful than the constitutional tactics. In terms of the press reaction, 
the press was extremely hostile and actually quite vicious in terms of um, its response to the start of the militant uh, tactics in Ireland. And it has been argued that, in fact, the more militant the suffrage movement became, the more the press boycotted them. Of course, this was in the days of social without social media. So if the press boycotted you, then they were really denying you the fuel of publicity to such an extent that the suffragists in Ireland had to set up their own newspaper, The Irish Citizen, to counter that kind of press negative reporting and indeed the press boycott. So to defend militancy, Margaret Cousins wrote an article in 1914 on the defensibility of militancy. And she said that women were in slavery and this model, this, this kind of metaphor of slavery was often invoked by the suffragists, that, milit that women were in slavery and therefore they had no choice but to adopt militancy. And she said militancy was actually a form of self-defense. And she said any women whose lives were at risk, um, who couldn't feed their children, that militancy was a very justifiable and defensible tactic in such extreme circumstances. So just to bring this to a conclusion with some thoughts and to link back to some of the things that Andreas was saying earlier. I think what's really fascinating about the suffragettes, and perhaps this is different from almost all other groups, perhaps with the exception of armed um, campaigns like the IRA, for example, but that the militant suffragette, far from being forgotten by history, the militant suffragette has become a bit of a folk heroine. And ironically, it's the constitutional suffragists who were far more numerous who've actually been forgotten. As I said earlier, I'm sure most people have heard of the Women's Social and Political Union. I bet almost nobody has heard of the uh, constitutional equivalents who were actually much more numerous. However, it would be misleading to ignore the significance of the very, very large number of constitutional suffragists who worked away tirelessly for decades to shift political opinion and to gradually gain support for the suffrage cause. And that took an enormous amount of work and continual effort over more than 50 years. At that time, militancy was highly controversial and it was viewed by many hardworking and passionate constitutional suffragists as actually damaging their cause. And indeed, some argued that it was more about the egos of particular suffragette individuals, namely the Pankhurst themselves. The publicity factor needs to be balanced against the risk of a press boycott. Ultimately, looking back historically, I think what we can say, and this brings me back to Andreas, is perhaps both of these groups in a way kind of complemented each other, even, even though they were often highly critical of each other, in a sort of good cop, bad cop relationship. And as Andreas said, in a way, having this militant group who were going around burning down theatres and setting fire to cathedrals, they were the radical flank. And in a way, perhaps they did make the constitutional suffragists seem more palatable to politicians who were prepared to sit down and engage more with constitutional suffragists, kind of almost in opposition to this very, very loud and radical flank. So I just wanted to share those thoughts about the Irish suffrage movement and the ways in which perhaps we can learn some lessons uh, from their experiences. I always believe that we can learn lessons from history. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Louise. That, that, that's really fascinating. I think bo both in its own right as, as, a, as a whistle stop tour of, of the history of suffragism in Ireland only 100 years ago. Uh, and, and in terms of the richness of the, of the potential dilemmas and uh, tensions and opportunities uh, that, 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 uh, that go very much with what Andreas was talking about and what, what any, any uh, militant movement would, would face now too. And as you said, with, with the addition of, of social media, which could be both, could, end, could, could both give you your own channels to, to promote, uh, to, to, to get your message out, but also all the opportunities for trolling and uh, polarization that can occur with social media, which is something the suffragettes didn't have to contend with. Uh, one after after all that nuance, one on nuance comment. It is interesting. You talked about the how we remember both the suffragettes and the term suffragette. It is it, it seems to be an example of, you know, history is written by the victors. Uh, so at the time, suffragette was a derogatory term for those who were being militant, and now it's the only term we think of when we think about the struggle for for uh, for um for the for the for the votes for women. So that that you know, 
if we succeed in stopping climate change, then however we got there will probably be, be valued and it'll be for historians to pick to pick apart where the majority of the credit goes, if, we, if we're lucky enough to have historians in the future. Um, right, um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but thank you so much for that. And oh yeah, as I reminded everybody to, um, to upvote, as they say, to vote for your favorite questions in the Q&A. We will get to some. Don't forget, there will be a whole workshop in two weeks' time where a lot of the themes will be taken up in a far more participative way. But I'm going to turn now to the to the, our next um, panelist, uh, which is William first. Um, um, to William, you have been a freelance journalist, a photographer, and a campaigner um, for many, many years. Uh, you're a former Irish Times journalist, and you've been involved in environmental and social justice campaigns, including uh, ones that involve direct action um, in, the, in the civil disobedience sense, if not the property destruction sense, uh, over the past 20 years. So I'm really keen to hear from you about uh, about your experience <laughs> of it. I mean, interestingly, we've been talking about history and what's been written in and out of history. If anything, my, you know, you were involved in the, in the Rossport Solidarity in the Chelsea Sea uh, context. Um, and if anything, in that context, what got written out of history was the violence by state forces and potentially corporate forces, certainly private forces, against those who are involved in peaceful civil disobedience uh, in, in, in the West of Ireland, far from both mainstream and to some degree social media uh, uh, attention. Um, can you talk can you talk a bit about the activism you've been involved in and where it got to on the spectrum we've talked about and what was the reaction uh, to that from 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 the public that 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 saw it and from state and private forces? Sure, great. Uh, thanks very much, Oshin. Thanks to Friends of the Earth for hosting this really important discussion and to the other speakers. It's been it's been really fascinating. And uh, just following on what's been said already in particular by Andreas this evening and in other interviews that I've, I've heard him um, uh, give uh, the you know I'm very interested in when thinking about direct actions that I've been involved in planning or that I've written about or researched uh, I'm interested very much in how restricted activists feel um, and how kind of by fear of backlash by fear of how they're going to be received um, what is the public or media or mainstream political reaction going to be? Uh, property destruction is often seen as out of bounds, as a fear of dividing the movement, causing uh, harm to the movement. So it's just interesting to look back at quickly. Just I've just picked a few examples of of, of campaigns that involve direct action uh, in terms of demonization and the lack of public sympathy, and then about looking at sort of effectiveness or otherwise, and also about so, something you heard um, Andrea say in another interview was about how success. Uh, something I very much agree with, you know, success can be slow to become evident, you don't always see it uh, at the time, but just very briefly first to just mention uh, something I definitely wasn't involved in, I was only 14, this was uh, the Dunn Store strike, and Oshin mentioned apartheid. Uh, in 1984, workers in Dunn Stores in Dublin refused to handle goods from South Africa. They were mostly ignored, but also marginalised, they were abused by their fellow staff, and, and uh, they're now seen as heroes. Um, so their direction action at the time didn't get much sympathy and it took three years, but they were ultimately successful and the government banned uh, the importation of goods from South Africa. Um, and they're now seen as heroes, but but very much not at the time. Um, jumping forward a few years to something I did have a more close uh, that I that I was certainly close to, not, not not involved in myself, but and I wrote about it at the time, but at the pit stop. Plow, plowshares. So these were peace activists, also known as they're members of the Catholic Worker Movement. And in February 2003, just before George W. Bush's invasion of, of Iraq, they used they, they broke into Shannon Airport into a hangar and uh, they used axes and hammers to smash up the nose of a U.S. warplane. And they caused two point five million dollars worth of damage. Um, the report, media reports the next day. Um, described that they had assaulted a garden and this this turned out not to be true uh in fact it turned out they had comforted the guard who was who was asleep in fact guarding the plane as it turned out but you know at the time they were demonized init initially and they were seen as being violent and threatening and sinister uh ultimately a jury uh, uh a jury acquitted them unanimously of criminal damage uh and the defense that they used and that was accepted by the jury was that uh, by smashing up the US warplane, they were preventing a greater harm, loss of life and greater destruction in Iraq. Um, I suppose that on the question of success um, or otherwise, they didn't change 
the policy that the US that the Irish government had, which was their aim to try and stop the US, the Irish government allowing US warplanes to refuel at Shannon. I, I suppose had more, this is something they call for, more people to do the same, had more people followed their lead, I think there would have been a huge impact. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that it took, I think, three and a half years until they were acquitted. So that's also a strategy by the state to delay. Uh, you know, it was there was sort of diffused and there wasn't that opportunity for people maybe to follow them. Um, but moving on to um, something that I was involved in um, for years with the Shaw to Sea campaign, and most of you know this was from, from the early noughties for a decade or so, um, a grassroots campaign in North Mayo to resist an extremely high pressure gas, raw gas pipeline uh, being built by Shell. Um, and there were wide, a very wide array of direct action tactics um, and in direct action training, uh, given in 2018, 2019, we had a series of slides and we counted out about 25 different types of direct action, including property damage. Um, the, the campaign was uh, a led by the local community. It was um, a very strong local campaign. And those initial direct actions were by the Rossport Five landowners who became known as the Rossport Five who went to prison. Uh, and there was also then a, an 18 month blockade of the refinery site where local people and that supporters from outside put their bodies in the way and prevented uh, work going on. Um, it's interesting that I suppose just thinking about this, that you know, this this was in terms of fear of demonization, this was a local campaign. There was a lot of sympathy nationally for, for this campaign. They were a just cause, they had broad support, but they were extremely there, there was there was an extreme demonization. The Shell, the government, the Gardaí, the police in Ireland, uh, and the mainstream media and other entities conspired to to smear and demonize the Shell to Sea campaign. It became really a dirty word. Uh, there were even fictional uh, there were kind of entirely fictitious media stories, particularly in from crime correspondents, uh, saying that the IRA were running the campaign, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's that's interesting. You know, there was this demonization, despite it being the kind of campaign that it was, a local campaign and that, and and despite the initial public sympathy. So you know, you're going to get that no matter what. I mean, you're, you're likely to get be demonized and have a backlash if you're going to engage, particularly if you're going to engage in direct action and civil disobedience. Um, I think, um, but it's important to big up successes and uh, this campaign, although they didn't succeed, their ultimate aim was to um, have the gas, force Shell to refine the gas at sea. This, this wasn't achieved, but uh, there were many successes. And again, these are more evident looking back. There were huge delays. Uh, there were huge cost overruns. Shell, uh, Shell exited the project a few years ago with a 1 billion euro, approximately 1 billion euro loss. And bear in mind that Shell's sole aim is to, is to make money. And that's, that, that, so that, that was how they ended up coming out of the project. Uh, there was a powerful message to industry um, that, you know, this is something maybe not to just try to take local uh, a chill effect, as was mentioned earlier, there was a chilling effect towards, towards industry on, on this. Uh, it also generated a huge debate about control of our, our natural resources. Um, and uh, it also, leading on to another campaign, the anti-fracking campaign, which was a, a, an absolute success uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Fracking was banned, as many as most people will know, in 2017. Um, in Ireland, there was an important uh, cross-pollination and sharing of knowledge and tactics from the Shell to Sea campaign uh, with seminars and booklets and that. Um, very early on, the anti-fracking campaign was, was given advice and help from the Shell to Sea campaign. And uh, this, um, this was a huge victory, the anti-fracking campaign. Uh, that was in 2017, as I said. Uh, I suppose there, hasn't, there wasn't much direct action because, in fact, fracking was banned before it really got to that stage. There certainly was the threat of direct action. Um, so coming up to, so I'm just seeing how much time I have, coming up to the more present day, um, the campaign that I've been involved in the last couple of years as a campaign against Shannon LNG, this is an attempt to build a, um, an LNG import terminal 
on the Shannon Estuary in North Kerry. There's been some direct action already. There was an occupation. Uh, I mean, it was a group of us did last September. There have been a couple of occupations of the site. Uh, and crucially, uh, looking ahead, in this coming August, uh, there is going to be a climate camp close to the site of Shannon LNG in North Kerry. Uh, this will be the first climate camp in Ireland in 12 years. Uh, it was supposed to happen in 2020 for uh, because of the pandemic. It didn't. Um, there were climate camps in Ireland, interestingly, in 2009 and 2010. Uh, and it, as with this coming one this August, so it's the 2nd to the 7th of August, I should say. And uh, if you want to get involved, I'm just going to paste um, a, an email address here into the chat. Uh, that's Schliella. Um, the uh, climate camp is going to be organized by Schliella. Uh, which is a relatively new anti-capitalist direct uh, climate campaign. Uh, and there will be, it'll be a great place to come and have more discussions like this about direct action. Uh, and there will be direct action taking place. Uh, it's interesting that there haven't been any climate camps in all the intervening years since 2010. The last one was against a road project in, uh, in County Tyrone. And um, in 2009, it was at a, um, peat burning power plant uh, in the Midlands. Um, so I suppose, sorry, it's my timer. <laughs> um, the, yeah, so, so just, I, I suppose I wanted to just kind of finish up by, by coming back to that point I made about um, how hung up we are as a, as, a, as a people, I think we're very, as a population, but but also within activism, we're quite well trained and conditioned to uh, see um, some types of law breaking and property destruction as absolutely out of bounds. Uh, there's a, there's a, we're ham, hamstrung by this to some extent. And uh, I suppose these rules are set by powerful interests by, for example, fossil fuel companies and by their uh, allies in governments. And, uh, you know, industry and government, they don't really feel a threat um, because of this. Um, but I think that uh, we need to, you know, I think it's time to, clearly the time has come to, the, the time to worry about this is, is, is sort of past when we think about the effects. Just to take an example, I mean, data centers in Ireland, uh, as, as people will know, data centers are um, using a colossal proportion of our electricity consumption it's growing it's growing at an exponential rate opinion polls have shown that um a majority of people in Ireland don't want more data centers they want to be restricted the government is 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 ignoring this um they're not taking the threat seriously um so i think um i know that it probably a little bit over time there there are many other examples i could give but uh i'll just Thanks, leave it there for now Oshin. Yeah, that's fab. And, uh, and you've mentioned the array, the, the historical range uh, from, our, from your lifetime uh, and uh, the experience uh, uh, in recent years around Sh Shadow Sea uh, and, and fracking uh, and some of the areas where it could become a live issue in the coming in the coming decade. I, I would be keen. I'm going to bring Zach in now, but I'd be keen to come, come maybe before the end, come back to get a sense of what any of the people think here, well, those of us who are Irish, yeah, is there an appetite for any of this? I mean, we haven't seen a lot of direct action. We've seen, as I said, a diversity of, of, of demands, but not a diversity of, of, of strategy or tactics very much. Uh, do we think there is a, uh, never mind what the public would, would, would say, but is there a critical mass of, like a small critical mass of people who might, who might do this sort of thing? Or what might it take for that to become real? Is it the power of example, or is it some more, you know, more extreme effects of climate or more extreme uh, lack of, lack of, uh, policy progress anyway we might come back to that before the end i'm really keen to bring zach in though and then to get some of the questions people have uh zach, zach you came to this a little bit after william's time a little bit after to see in the in the xr period i think and um, let me say a few words about your friend. uh my questions to you will be much the same as they were to, as, as they were to to um uh to william but you you described yourself in the in the bio you gave us as a socialist climate activist and member of the international marxist tendency you've been involved with extinction rebellion and animal rebellion in ireland and you've been arrested twice, uh, and you want to, you're going to share your insights about your experiences with XR and the relationship between capitalism and the climate crisis, um, and how we get out of here. 
maybe with a bit of help from Marxist theory. Uh, tell us though, tell us a bit about your about your experience and actually just to bring that question in now, like you, you've been through some uh, in and around XR, some of that activism. Where do you think that energy is now? And where is it, like where are we at after obviously two years of COVID hasn't helped that energy, uh, that, 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 that momentum. Where do you see it going now? And is there an appetite for a diversification of tactics? I mean, Andreas is in, in the book, even more than in his talk, like the, the strategic pacifism is, is an XR thing. The XR has been very strong on it. Is that evolving in your experience or might others break off from it to do more, to, 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 to have a more diverse um, uh, range of tactics? Cheers, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll come to your questions. Um, but I think, first of all, what I'm going to say is, I think we kind of need to like almost cut through this like Gordian knot on the question of violence versus like nonviolence in tactics for persuading the ruling class. And honestly, I'm going to argue that we can't just continue to persuade the ruling class to make changes. Instead, what we really need to do is create our own organs of working class power, you know, uh, of workers' democracy. Um, this means, you know, people coming to their, you know, local assemblies um, in, in their towns or their workplaces and making decisions for ourselves rather than allowing the current capitalist class to continue making decisions for us. Um, but yeah, I'll come, I'll come back to this. Um, and first of all, I'll kind of go th through my own experiences. I mean, like, you know, I started being terrified uh, about, you know, the climate and ecological emergency at age like 11, um, I was getting these um, magazines, they were National Geographic Kids magazines, um, talking about how, you know, the polar bears are dying and the ice caps are melting. Um, and uh, I was terrified. I mean, I, I was 11 and I was like, you know, reading through these and I'm like, oh my God, how could, how could this happen? Um, and uh, the solutions in the National Geographic Kids magazines were, uh, you know, turn off the lights and um, uh, turn off the taps while you clean your teeth. And I think we probably, hopefully, all recognize that um, we're a little bit beyond that at this stage. Um, but yeah, I, you know, decided that I was going to work really, really hard and I'd become a scientist and I'd show everyone why they needed to care about the polar bears or whatever. Um, so I'm now studying um, biology. Um, and I actually just finished my finals uh, last week. So if any of this is a little bit fried, it's probably because uh, I'm slightly exhausted. <laughs> um, but at college, you know, I was learning more about this. Um, and uh, it was really, it was too much for me. Um, uh, I couldn't just continue with my studies um, as I was going um, because I was so upset and depressed about the climate crisis. And I ended up taking a year out um because I, I couldn't cope with things um and uh you know i took a little bit of time to get better uh, but this is when i got involved in in activism um and xr had splashed onto the scene so this was um i was taking my break in uh, 2019 um uh, and i got right in i got involved in you know leafleting campaigns etc um and quickly i was like i don't think this is radical enough um and got involved in some of the more radical um, actions. Um, I got involved with Animal Rebellion Ireland um, and the first time I was arrested was at a protest at a meat plant. So activists from Animal Rebellion Ireland, we went to Keepak uh, in Clonny um, and we did a dem demonstration on the link between animal agriculture uh, and pandemics um, and also the climate crisis etc. Um, and I was arrested again about four months later um, at a protest of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so my friend Orla um, on the Fridays for Future International Day of Action uh, threw paint at the Department of Foreign Affairs and wrote No More Empty Promises. Uh, and I was there with, uh, with a camera uh, live streaming the event and we were both arrested. Um, and well, the first case uh, uh, was dismissed um, just about a month ago, uh, but the second case is, is going to be happening over the summer. Um, but while I've been on my very strict bail conditions for the last year and a bit, um, uh, I've been digging deeper into the sort of theory um, behind XR because I, I mean, really, you know, well, in, in my um, anxiety and, and uh, nervousness for the state of the world, you know, the fact that, you know, the last 
19 of the last 20 years have been the hottest on record, for example, you know, these kind of things um, really showed some urgency for me. Um, but since I've been on bail and have been able to do actions, um, I've kind of dug a, a bit into the theory. Um, and I think uh, Andreas and uh, Louise um, uh, have shown, um, uh, Andreas in particular, the sort of like, a, you know, limitations uh, of XR um, and, uh, and uh, the, I suppose in a way, you know, almost historical rewriting of things. Um, and I'm now really convinced that um, we can't convince the ruling class to, to change, you know, and I don't think we can coerce or force them to change either um, through, um, you know, these, you know, very, very disruptive actions. Um, and I think that there are two reasons for that that are really inherent in, in capitalism, because um, capitalism uh, can't solve this crisis. One of them is, you know, the inbuilt overproduction crises of capitalism. So imagine you're a capitalist or we'll say, you can't call it a capitalist. You have to be called an entrepreneur, right? You're an entrepreneur and um, you've just started a business producing commodities. And obviously your goal is to maximize your profit. Um, so this means making as much commodity as you can, um, but then paying your workers as little as possible. But um, we'll say Evelyn is also an entrepreneur. Sorry, Evelyn. Um, and Evelyn's trying to do the exact same thing right, you know, maximize um, commodity production and uh, minimize labor costs. And what I really hope is that Evelyn pays her workers loads so that they have money to buy my commodities. But Evelyn's thinking the same thing. But obviously this creates a problem, right? If every, you know, worker produces a greater value of commodities, then they can actually buy back with their wages. You suddenly have a glut of products. Um, and this is why capitalism constantly ends up in crisis. You know, there are crises of overproduction, but then suddenly there's this artificial scarcity where people actually can't afford um, to, um, to buy back these commodities. And th this isn't a secret. I mean, I'm sure loads of you have seen videos from Amazon warehouses where they were destroying literally millions of items of perfectly good stock, you know, uh, flat screen TVs, iPads, medical PPE, et cetera. Um, like it, they revealed in Scotland that like in a single week, they destroy 200,000 items a week in these destruction centers. Um, and uh, this can relate to the climate crisis as well. Um, not only is this massive of production terrible in terms of, of its environmental impacts, um, but it also is hindering um, technologies um, on solving the climate crisis. So, in 2017, The Economist wrote this article about the dirty secret of green energy. The thing is, with green energy, the more of it you deploy, the lower the price of power from any source. Um, so this makes it hard to transition to a carbon-free future um, and also um, maintain profits. You know, so we have it from the horse's mouth <laughs> really here um, from The Economist. You know, the more abundantly and cheaply reproduce energy, the quicker the markets get saturated. Uh, and then we have a, a you know, classic case of, of overproduction. And then this is the second, this kind of leads us on to the second um, inherent problem uh, with capitalism in, in terms of solving the climate crisis. And that's um, what it could be called the anarchy of the market. Um, you know, I mean, I've already said that I don't think politicians can be persuaded by moral arguments but even if they were the market is not in any politician's control you know capital and profit um accumulation is what dictates um you know it's like sort of like a to quote the communist manifesto if i can it's like a sorcerer who can't control the powers um of the netherworld um whom he has called up by his spells so corporations will just rush through and you know ride roadshod through regulations wherever necessary to reduce costs um, and to outcompete their rivals um, and you know the development of science technique industry has brought us to the cusp of an era where you know as humans we can develop fully you know in harmony with the environment yet under capitalism um, these you know economic relations rise up uh, and condemn billions potentially to, to suffering. 
and are guiding our whole species to a, to a precipice. Um, I, I think really that the only, you know, way we can have sustainable development is through um, uh, a socialist plan of production. So under private ownership, capitalists will continue the pollution um, that might make, you know, mass crop failure um, uh, inevitable through heating. But uh, if workers were uh, in control in terms of like democracy within the workplace, not democracy where you vote for for a new party every four years, but democracy where you make decisions at the workplace um, and in, in local assemblies. We could really quickly shut down the fossil fuel industries that are condemning millions to death. We could you know, reclaim these vast amount of land that are held by a super rich minority and allow them to rewild and sequester large amounts of carbon, et cetera. And we could cut the pollutive work that millions have to go through every day just to keep a roof over their heads. So really, I think, you know, this is what this should be is, you know, a question of, of are we trying to reform the capitalist system? Are we trying to convince politicians um, that they shouldn't invest in fossil fuels um, because we're not going to let it happen? Uh, or is it a question of, uh, of revolution? Um, you know, are we going to, you know, we as in ordinary people, you know, working people, students, et cetera, going to take, take control of, uh, of the economy uh, and plan things ourselves. Um, so yeah, I think one thing in particular that um, the, the, the question of, of blowing up pipelines reminds me of is uh, the Narodniks. Um, so before, before the Russian revolution, um, people were, well, everyone <laughs> was fed up with Tsarism, we could say, um, you know, it, it, um, there were, you know, you know, huge campaigns um, against the Tsar. And uh, one particularly radical um, flank emerged um, of the Narodniks and they had these campaigns of um, assassination against the Tsar and, and government figures. Um, but they were they were hugely unpopular, um, um, and ultimately they they weren't successful. They've kind of almost been described as uh, liberals with bombs. Um, and really, I think what we need to have is not a change in the the radicalism of our of our tactics, but in the radicalism um, of our politics. So how how does this all of this maybe so far it seems a little bit abstract. Um, can I stop you there for now? Although I've lost Andreas. I thought I had an extra five. I thought I had him until half seven and I was going to bring him in now as I messaged you. Uh, but I think because he but he has another meeting at half seven, so I've lost him. But I am conscious we told everybody we were leaving, we were finishing at half seven. So I want to uh I want to get to some of the questions in the QA, and you can come back in on those as well. There's this four Sorry about questions that. in the QA that um that have well, actually now there's one that has there's one that has which I wasn't going to give to Andreas because it's more for Ireland, but uh, um, compared to some of the others. Um, uh, but I'm keen to see what any of you make of, of these. And I'm going to basically name the top four. You can, everyone can see what the top four questions are. So I'm going to name them but, and just name them very briefly and ask each of our uh, of the panelists to give us basically, well, we might try and squeeze another extra five minutes out of our audience if we can. Um, and I know you have, to, you have to guide us at the end, Evelyn. Um, to give your, your 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 reflections on the questions and on anything you heard from everybody else, I'm I'm sorry I was I was too fascinated by what you were saying to keep to keep discipline on timing well enough. But the four questions that came top of the poll was basically really interestingly, Zaka speaking as someone who, as yourself, who's just finished their finals. The first question is from a school striker who's been annoyed there hasn't been any workplace striking for the climate in response to school striking. Now, I'm not aware as to what degree that was asked for. But, uh, and you don't always get it if you don't ask for it, but there hasn't been much. So the question is about the, the role of unions and could workplace striking help us move along? Not you know, a, a little bit different, but not, not a million miles from what you were talking about there, Zach, in terms of workplace democracy. Uh, one of the questions I really wanted to ask Andreas, and he touches on it in his book, but others may have, 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 a, have views on it as well, is like, how do you, how do you hit the, share, the, 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 the capitalists, the, the shareholders where it hurts and the big polluters rather than those, who, those uh, in traffic or the general public, how, how do we, if we're taking action, make sure we're hitting the right, the right spots? Uh, and that's from Johannes. Connor asked one about the unions. And Emma Jane has a question about, uh, actually, Tracy's questions disappeared. There was a question with seven, with seven, uh, oh, sorry, here it is, actually. It's been moved into answered, which is about, um, which I thought was an interesting one about the actions 
direct actions, particularly maybe property destruction, even more than non-violent direct actions, but maybe both, need a lot of discipline. How is that? How do you square that with the non-hierarchical structure of, of things like XR? Someone maybe has answered that. Uh, so, William, you might, you might answer it live again so that everybody gets the benefit of your wisdom. Um, but your answer, your, your short answer is there. Uh, and finally, Emma Jane uh, ha has a question about um, not confining ourselves to climate, uh, but supposed to be the role of class and, and choice in being able to participate in these issues, and also about cross movement solidarity uh, and climate climate protesters who've, who've taken solidarity actions with those who've been deported at Heathrow Airport. So I'm not asking all of you to answer all of those questions, but in the in the minute or two that each of you speak, and from your own experience or expertise, are, are, do you have any reflections on any of those? Uh, uh, on any of those particular questions, and I'm going to go. I'm going to go the other way around. But I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to. I'm going to go to William first, uh, then to Louise, and then to. Well, actually, I'll go backwards. I'll go to William, Zach, and then Louise. Uh, thanks very much. I, yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. There's some really interesting questions there. Yeah. Just on that question about discipline. Uh, that that's. I'm, I'm. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, the. Yeah. I, I agree very much that. Discipline is really important uh, when um, organizing direct actions, in particular property destruction, et cetera. But uh, there's a key difference, as I've said there in that short answer, that between hierarchy and discipline, I mean, I think non-hierarchical or horizontal organizing is really important strategically uh, and for lots of reasons when organizing direct action. Uh, and that's, that's a key part of its success uh, is that um, the state and other powerful entities can't there isn't a particular leader for them to single out or or uh, demonize or, or attack in some way or other um so but yeah discipline absolutely is important <coughs> excuse me uh yeah i think definitely to answer the other question unions definitely could do more and it would be great i mean uh a, a general strike you know um about climate would be would be would be brilliant um and then in terms of hitting polluters um yeah, just to reiterate that point, I suppose in terms of strategy, that um, <coughs> uh, blocking traffic is less direct. I mean, there's a difference between militant action and direct action and uh, targeting fossil fuel infrastructure, blockading, uh, for example, a fossil fuel infrastructure in some way or sabotaging it or whatever would be more direct and is less likely to annoy the general public, but also hits the shareholders and the executives uh, where it hurts and if I could just if I could just finish up by saying um you know I think that there are fears expressed there about the backlash again and about you know alienating people I think that direct action including you know some of the direct actions that we've talked about um and that Andreas has advocated would be a catalyst it would spark uh, a, a total rethinking and a total debate uh, just to go back to the plowshares that I gave the example of, people at first thought, oh, these people smashed up a warplane. That's not helpful. Twelve people, when they were presented with the arguments, it, within within minutes, they reached their verdict and said, no, they were absolutely right to do what they did. So once people have time to think about it, so we need, we need a debate. Um, it, it can be a catalyst, as I said. It can reframe the debate. And also, direct action is really empowering. So hopefully we'll see people between the 2nd and 7th of August at the climate camp in, uh, in Kerry. Thanks. Thanks, William. Um, Zach, some of your some of your thoughts on well, you've met on, on unions, for example, uh, are, are, are any of the other issues that you wanted to come in on, but it, for 90 seconds, <laughs> two minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, yeah, I think young people um, have every right to be uh, disappointed um, with the current state uh, of unions. Um, you know, there's been very little um, engagement, I would say, from from unions in terms of um, the climate strike. Um, and uh, I think you know young people are are coming to to the right conclusions. I mean, it is after all, you know, the Fridays for Future strikes are called strikes, uh, and they're sort of a reminder of of how powerful strikes are uh, as a tool. And I mean, I obviously, I um, absolutely think that uh, uh, a general strike is is the direction that we need to be going. Um, how do we do that? How do we change the unions? First of all, um, you know, join join a union, um, become part of a union. And talk to your fellow workers and, you know, encourage your friends to join um, and bring up um, environmental demands uh, within the unions um, and also connect um, the, you know, the, how capitalism can't solve the climate crisis with how capitalism will constantly try and drive down wages um, and how it's responsible for all manner of other, you know, sexist, racist uh, and um, uh, exploitative uh, uh, things that we see throughout our society. 
Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Um, I mean, I think the union debate will be fascinating. I'm going to ask Louise about unions too in a second. But I, I will say, I know some some union officials have been really practically supportive of the climate strikes in the background. Isn't the same thing as the unions as a whole, you know, coming on board any form of of of, uh, of industrial action. Louise, you may or may not. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sure you'll have something to, something to say, but I'm particularly interested actually in 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 this in the suffragist element in the suffragist anal analogies here on two of these issues. One is with unions and, and what sort of relationship was there between suffrage, the suffrage move, movement and unions, and where, was there much solidarity? Uh, and the more general question Emma Jane asked about that about the intersection with other course, co other causes, because obviously as well as labour and um, and suffrage, hundred years ago in Ireland we had we had independence. So there may be some particular things there, but feel free to share your your uh, your thoughts on on any of those aspects that we've been, that we've heard about. Well, I'm going to be very bold, Oshin. I'm not going to talk about any of those things because it's all in my book. So I've written a whole book where I talk about the labour movement, the nationalist movement, and the suffrage movement, and all of that. So I'm not going to say that. I can see the numbers are dwindling, so I know people are, are rushing to go. So I just want to say one thing. I really firmly believe that we've got a moment now. And I'm speaking very much from the UK context. I've lived here a long time. I'm not as familiar with the Irish context anymore. In this country, the UK, we have massive fuel poverty. It's on the news all the time that people cannot afford to heat their houses. There has never been a time, I think, when the whole fuel industry, when the whole capitalist system around fossil fuels was more vulnerable than it is right now. It's really ripe for a good kicking because people will vote with their pockets. You can take until you're blue in the face. This is one thing we can learn from the suffragists. Until you're blue in the face trying to persuade people and they're not always willing to listen. They're not always willing to come with you. But you need to connect with them on something that makes sense to them. And at the moment, most people are dreadfully worried about fuel poverty. They're dreadfully worried about facing a winter next October when they will not be able to pay their gas and their heat bills. If there was ever a moment when green movements could say, right, we have a solution to this, it's now. And if the green movements don't take advantage of this now, they will have missed a vital opportunity, which may not come until everything is far too late. So that would be my one passionate plea. Kick them now when they're really up against it, because they are up against it right now. That's my finishing point. Louise, thank you so much. I'm glad you. I'm glad you totally ignored me and, and said what you wanted to say. And right for a kicking is a is a is a good um, is a good uh, place to end. And as it happens, this day next week, those of you who want to join local climate action campaign groups, uh, which we support along with other organisations in the South Climate Case Coalition, that's the One Future Network of local climate action campaign groups. There is a meeting next Monday to talk about that very thing. How does the climate movement at, at local level, in particular, but not just local level, uh, get active on the energy poverty issue in a way that, that helps those at risk of energy poverty or in energy poverty and uh, our goal of, of, uh, of acting fast enough to prevent climate breakdown. So you've, you've, you've done our, our, our promotion job for us as well, Louise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Evelyn in a second. Um, but thank you. thanks to the speakers very much, Andreas, whose book we really recommend. You can still get it in some bookshops and definitely through our website, you can get it. Uh, and to uh, William, uh, and Louise and Zach for their really interesting and insightful and um, inspiring <laughs> uh, thoughts. So thank you all very much. And I hope we'll see you, our, our, our participants again in, in future workshops. Uh, this has been a fascinating one for me. Thank you. Evelyn, back to you to, for the final remarks. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you so much to our speakers. I know Andreas had to head off, but he sent his thanks to everyone for the really interesting discussion. And he sent his uh, best wishes for our follow-up workshop discussion with all the participants. Thank you.